ಹಾರ David? Lionel? David? Hey, Lionel. I got a question for you, buddy. I'm here. Is this, uh, is this the first podcast since the last podcast? Absolutely. It always is. Uh... Uh, David, you're a bit of a historian. You you like to you like to live on the edge. You like to do doing exciting things, don't you? Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, tonight we are about to engage in an AML first. This is the first time <laughs> on the AML network this has ever happened. Okay. But, uh, it's a it's a historic night. You like to be. I, I bet you're one of those guys who would like to be present in when historic things happen. Absolutely. Well, uh, so uh, this uh, particular podcast is called Ad, uh, A- Abilis and Pinellas on the Summit. And, okay. And primarily the podcast is, a, is Dave Abilis and Adam Pinellas talking about uh, uh, Soldier Summit, taking trains over the summit. It's just a great podcast. Now, unfortunately, Adam uh, ruined his, uh, his internet, but it's still uh, quite listenable. And it's great. Uh, it's it's great until all of a sudden the whole thing cuts off. But the problem is, <laughs> we did an introduction for this, right? And I was a little sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the understatement of the night. <laughs> yeah, to the point where I kind of nodded off once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was boring you. Yeah. So we tried to do the whole intro, and then I'm listening to it, and we can't do that intro without an intro for that intro. (laughs) Okay. So this is the first time in the history of the AML that we have an intro for an intro, which is an intro for a show that didn't really have a proper intro. Okay. (laughs) Because I just flat out, there was one point while we were doing it, it's about 15 minutes long, and there's one point where we're doing it where I actually believe I completely fell asleep. And well, you, you know, I I, I I I stopped by to help you so that you're not alone, but I'm not even sure I could save that one. Yeah. <laughs> there was a point in the middle where you're talking about as fast as you can trying to come up with stuff because you can't tell if I'm with it, if I've passed out. <laughs> right. And then I kind of come back to life again. And but then towards the end, I start fading out again when we get to the end. So, anyways, this is just a quick, uh, quick explanation to the, our introduction because it's. Uh, I was thinking I'll just scrap it, but then I thought, you know, uh, this is a true statement. I believe here at the old AML Network, we try to be as transparent as possible. Yes, and, and I thought, you know what, this is uh, podcasting is a grueling, grueling. Uh, job. I mean, it's just, you know, you're constantly, you got to put all the, you got to glue all the little airwaves together and, you know, it's just a grueling, it's a grind. Podcasting is a grind. Okay. And uh, so I think I just kind of faded out, faded out and that was it. It happens. Yeah. No, no, I don't <laughs> believe it's happened before. This is time it happened. <laughs> <laughs> the first time for everything. Yeah. Yeah, and I just didn't have the heart to not play it because it it is actually quite entertaining listening to me. There was actually one part that I cut out where I believe at that point I was completely dreaming and I just uttered out a a name of a particular person. And uh, (laughs) so... (laughs) You you, kind of snapped back after that one. Yeah, it's kind of like a... So I actually, yeah, and I kind of went, whoa, that was, uh, no, don't say, and I was like, where did that come from? <laughs> so I, uh, so yeah, it's very entertaining. I, uh, I had great fun. So we talk about the Jenkins and you did a really good job and it's all about, you made, you mentioned about his sausage fingers. So we talk about the Jenkins and what that is. It's a photo contest that we have that's going to sweep the nation, the AML nation, 
There's plenty of entries already. We try to explain it in greater detail. Uh, it's basically uh, uh, Martin Jenkins, our uh, Australian buddy. He has he constantly posts these dopey pictures where he's holding out his left hand, and he's got these giant sausage fingers, and he goes, "Look, I have a giant hand." <laughs> and uh, and then when we talk about uh, ketchup, and uh, I think that's about it. You know, we've already killed five minutes. Let's not overplay it. It's just basically a disaster that you save. This was the classic example of why I can never do a podcast, uh, an introduction by myself. And after this, I think you're going to be pretty touched by this. But I've decided to move you in a, into a position of vice president in charge of introductions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if, if you were alone, that you'd still be recording dead air. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's bizarre. That's what it is. That's what you're about to. Uh, you know what? This is another thing. This is my last thing, and then we'll do our subway chime. I apologize to all of the AML Nation. You are about to wait, completely waste 15 minutes of your life. <laughs> Only 15? <laughs> yeah, the rest is the rest is Dave and. and uh, okay. Dave, uh, Dave Abley's and Adam Pinellas, and they're very interesting. But uh, this next okay. in, this next uh, introduction that we attempted is about 15 minutes, and I apologize to everybody. At the end of that 15 minutes, you will have realized that that is 15 minutes of your life you will never, ever get back. But it's still worth it. Uh, <laughs> Maybe not. No. <laughs> Maybe you should start looking for the fast forward button. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you might say. <laughs> yeah. It's, at uh, thirty seconds at a clip, it's only it's only about you know thirty taps. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's unique. It's never been on. This type of uh, thing has never been on because there's a couple of places where I go, where I'm starting to go, and I'm, yeah, and uh, you know, <laughs> like there's gonna be a, a contest, and, and it'll be, you know, a contest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, do your best. All right. Subway chime, go. David. Lionel. David. Lionel. You know why you're here, don't you? <clears throat> uh, so you're not doing an intro by yourself? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's David. Intros start. Has, <laughs> has, has joined me in the studio. We're both quite sleepy. We've been working all day on this podcast, and it needs its own introduction because it's basically a big uh, mishmash. It's a cluster. Um, and Aren't they all, though? Yeah, they're all clusters. <laughs> they're all clusters, and we just mix them up and put them in the oven, and out they come. <laughs> That's what we need to do is have an AML baking show. Uh I'm uh, I'm tired. It's after midnight. I'm tired, but David has graciously uh, agreed to join me to create this introduction for the AML Nation, so that this show sounds logical. So this is today is um, don't tell me. Let me guess. I believe that today is in fact. Like the first show since the last show? Yes, this is the first uh, podcast since the last podcast that we've established. And, okay, we had, uh, we just had Tom Barbele on. That's that. This was this. So this show is on the 19th of October. So what we're going to okay. be doing, we're going to be doing intros and explanations for both the 19th of, of October and the 20th. So originally, my plan was that this show was going to be on the Patreon channel because it was a great show of Adam Pinellas and Dave Abelis talking trains, and they talked about uh, the guy that's now the was the editor of Trains, Mark Hemphill. Uh, he okay. now he's now a contra uh, consultant for another railroad project out there in Colorado. Mark Hemphill is going to have Dave uh, Adam Pinellas help him build this layout. Dave Abelis knows Mark Hemphill. Uh, we kind of introduced uh, Dave and Adam to each other. 
And then I just kind of lit the fuse and stood back, and away they went. <laughs> and great stories. I mean, halfway through, uh, Adam is talking about how he took most of the trains over Soldier Summit for the Utah Railway. Okay. So, so you can imagine Uncle Dave is just getting more and more amped up because, uh, you know, uh, Adam. Because that's what he does. <laughs> yeah, that's what he does. And Adam was taking all the trains over Soldier Summit. Which is like one of the coolest model railroad recognizable places in the in the entire lower forty eight. So, right. So the two of them get talking about that, and it's like whoa, 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 and I couldn't get it. I just finally just sat in the sidelines and watched. But then around the hour and seventeen minutes, so what had happened before the start of the show? The quality is not as good as you're used to here at the old AML network. Because okay. what began, what happened at the start of the show is Adam is building a beautiful waterfall for a seven and a half inch gauge railway that's right. going around his yard. And so he was doing some excavating and managed to rip the uh, cable, the cable that comes into the house right out of the wall, like right out of the wall. In true AML fashion. In true AML fashion. So then his audio wasn't as great, but he was quite listenable because he had tons to say. And the other thing we want to talk about during this introduction is the Jenkins. <laughs> There's been an introduction to the Jenkins on the uh, Face Fans page. Uh, Kevin Hardpart Marks put up a video about the Jenkins. And there's been lots of examples, and people have been trying to do the Jenkins. I think the best one so far is Mike Ostertag. i got to find an organized place to put them all. And then eventually, uh, there will be a committee that uh, selects five or six Jenkins. And the committee will be required to decide which Jenkins is the best. Okay. Yeah. And, and maybe you should explain to everybody what a Jenkins is. Because th th it, it is a multifaceted selfie picture. Yeah. it's a, What it is is... Martin Jenkins always shows up with this dopey picture of him with with his uh, chubby round fingers sticking out from his left arm, and he has this kind of this uh, what look on his face. It's the dumb looks are still free look. Yeah, the dumb looks are still free. Apparently, that's what it looks like because he's always got his hand out as if it look. I have five fingers. <laughs> um, and they're and they're, they're on my left hand. <laughs> Yeah, they're on my left hand. So that's what that... The Jenkins is a fun thing that was invented because we were looking at Jenkins pictures. So we're requesting that everybody in the AML Nation send in an entry. Uh, there'll be a committee to whittle those entries down to, say, 10 maybe. And we will allow... Uh, Jen, uh, what's his name? Jenkins. Martin. Martin. <laughs> yeah. Let me think. I'm I'm sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is a really good introduction. Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe even I can't save this one. <laughs> that was first. Um, to me, the key to the Jenkins is, you know, anybody can stick out their left hand, whether they have snossage fingers or not. <laughs> the, the key to the Jenkins is the dopey look. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You have to work on it. I can't seem to get the dopey look down. And I, and I think, too, it's the way that when you look at his hand, it's in a cupped position. The fingers are all spread out, but they're in right. a cupped position, which I think is critical. It, that's the full display of the snossage. Yeah, full display of the snossage fingers. And then uh, he has, most of the time, he's got his optivizer on, so you might want to throw that on. And he has this quizzical look, like as in, look, are these fingers all mine? I have five fingers. <laughs> yeah. So that's what you're going for. You're just going for a goofy look. So that's what we're, we've had several entries already. Uh, what we'll do is we'll have a committee that will narrow the entries down to say 10, five or 10. And then it will be up to Martin Jenkins to make the final selection with a lot of guidance from the rest of the judges. And he'll be the, uh, he will pick the winner of this year's Jenkins award. And what does said winner win? Said winner will get at least an AML t-shirt, probably some swag, 
and possibly we could hit up Model Railroad News for some sort of uh, prize. Awesome. Yeah. So that's what it was, and the and the notoriety. Okay. Of, of being the first winner of the Jenkins. Looking for full disclosure, so everyone knows what they're going to get. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, so I think that's it, buddy. I think we've. Uh, oh yeah, and we need to discuss the fact that I put ketchup on my fish and chips. I, I, for a guy that can't even fathom the thought of putting ketchup on a hot dog, and then you go and you put it on fish and chips, fish and chips was made for malt vinegar. And and at, at the very least, if if you if you don't use malt vinegar, cocktail sauce. Yeah. And then and then if you're absolutely desperate, you could probably consider tartar sauce. Although I certainly I would throw the fish away before I ate it with that, but. You certainly don't put ketchup on it. Okay. Maybe maybe on the French fries, but not on the fish. Yeah, I was. Uh, I met uh, young George, the boy wonder, for lunch, and we made a little video. And there I am putting ketchup on my fish and chips, like I thought a, a normal person would do. And mm-hmm. it turned out I was the one that was. Yeah, that that's to me that's a big no no. That was. I mean, I personally I wouldn't even own a bottle of ketchup, but you know, it 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 just certainly wouldn't take it out of the refrigerator for fish if, if, if i had to put ketchup on the fish i would throw the fish away because obviously it was bad <laughs> and, you were, and you were trying to kill the taste yeah how are those memberships coming uh they're rolling in by the day this is the favorite part of year right because they just come in droves and tons absolutely my mailman absolutely hates me the the uh, the other day after we, we had a we had a postal holiday here for founders day columbus day your uh thanksgiving thanksgiving and the following day i received 120 in the mail wow so that by my man i'm not really very favored by my mailman so just would you mind uh so people kind of understand what the whole process is could you just pick one at random just kind of flip through the pile and pick one out and open it up and then kind of explain to us what the procedure is well, we, we, we have to open it up and separate the, the form from the check. Did you get it? Was this a random one? This is a random one. It was the top one on, my, on the pile on my desk because there's always a pile on my desk this time of the year. And because the, any spare moment that I have, I do entry because they just seem never ending. And, you know, we, we go through and then we go to the database and we, we, we mark off all of the, the pertinent information of their payment. And, you know, whether I, I, I plead with my membership every year to, to update their either phone number or, and, or uh, email address. So I have a way to contact them without having to write a letter and mailing them. Um, although there are probably still almost 10% that that is the only way that I have to contact them. And, but I, I, I do try to get them to update and, and then we, we, I, I make a s- scan of every check and form and I make up a, a deposit and put the other in a pile and we go on to the next one. And what was in that? What was in that one that you opened up? Was it pretty uh, straightforward? It's, this this was a nice straightforward one. There was a there was a a a, a check. Actually, this this particular person selected a membership and a bundled with a calendar. So I need to add him to both databases, and because I I enter all of the ones that contain a calendar first because they need to be mailed out obviously in a more timely manner so that they have them as early as possible because I have to have my calendar, even though it's only right. My, my 2021 calendar, even though it's only October. Right. And people need to know what day Oct- uh, January 22nd is going to be. Absolutely. Is, and that, then we is, just, is that a service we could provide to the Erie Lackawanna Historical Society by kind of having like a dial tone and today <laughs> is October the 21st? Uh, that might, might, well, I don't know They some of them may not even have a radio. <laughs> that seems to be uh, a nice gentleman for, uh, uh, an email address. And he says, well, I don't have an email, but I have a telegraph key. 
So, um, so we're, we're, some of some of our members are technologically a little behind. It, good for them. I mean, I, I would. I, I wish I had a telegraph key, so I knew how to use it, and I'm sure he does. Um, I, I think I have a membership that I think every every antique typewriter in existence is distributed amongst my membership <laughs> so that they can type out their responses to me. And my guess is they're the you know they're the old black typewriters with the little round keys. Yes. So yeah. How many members are there? Currently, there are 1,061. And you have to deal with each membership and and on an individual basis. Somehow you deal with each membership on an individual basis. And then I, uh, so then one day you and I kind of got in a fight. About, uh, man, I'm like, uh, I'm falling asleep here. Boy, oh boy. Uh, I, I think I bored you to death. <laughs> no, it's not. We got to move on. We got to move on. That's what we got to do. We got to move on. I think this whole thing is just, okay. <laughs> we just got to move on. Um, I've never done a okay. podcast while I was dozing off. Uh, which it's Evidently. Which will be entertaining too. So uh, what happens here at the end of this segment, so we're going to start the segment. It's Adam Pinellas, primarily Adam Pinellas. And Dave Abley is talking about running trains out, out west. And Dave is thrilled to talk to him. And Adam's thrilled to tell him about it. But then Adam has pulled his uh, internet cable right out of his house. So he's using his phone. Then the internet gets crappy. And then the last thing we hear is the dog ate our guest. And uh, so <laughs> we'll, we'll pick it up from there. Is that the new subway chime? <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it could be this time. And in in uh, so we was this was going to be the Patreon show for this week, but it turned out it's not going to be the Patreon show. It's the free show, and the show that's was going to be the free show is the Patreon show. So we'll have to change that one too. But I feel one thing at a time. Get through this, and then we can work on the next show. And we've killed uh, fifteen minutes doing this. So do your thing, David. Let's get out of here. Subway chime, go. Hey Bruce. Hey Lionel. Hey Bruce. Hey Lionel. So, can you tell me if uh, oh, that was a good picture I took of you today. It was an outstanding picture. It captured <laughs> my uh, my essence perfectly. <laughs> and your and your partner took the the photo. And, yes. And uh, there was four photos, and that was the one. It was uh, it was uh, hit and miss. Yeah, and I don't understand that because you know you're looking at the the image in the camera supposedly while you're taking the picture, right? Like, you know, like but the, you must admit the shot of uh, the lower part of us and stuff on my desk is pretty good. That was a good one. Um, you know who the worst in all of the AML nation? You know who's the worst at taking pictures? Walking away, it's no contest. It don't bother having playoffs. Just give them the trophy every year. You know who's the worst at taking pictures? Kevin Marks. The modeler no. simply known as Kelly. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah. Just, just uh, he know, and he knows it too. What are you doing, Adam? He's uh, no. Well, these guys are into beer. Oh, well, the, I, I saw that smirk on uh, Dave's face, and uh, Mister Pinellas had one going a little earlier. I noticed. So. Uh, okay, that's what are you? I'm without beer. I should go get a beer. I feel. I feel like I'm being left out. You're without alcoholic beverages. I am. What did you just open there, Dave? Dave, I opened myself. It's one I've never tried. It's called Low Brow Nobility. Low Brow Nobility. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's by a short, short, promising. <laughs> short Throw Brewing Company. Uh, shortthrowbrewing.com from someplace up in New England. Short throw like as in a short throw on a turnout, you think? I think that's how I'm going to take it. It's from North Haven, Connecticut. So there's, it's, uh, that 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 walk the woods, and I have a bunch of buddies at work that uh, I trade beer with, and whenever any of us find something interesting, we buy three of them and you know trade back and forth. Adam, you're going to have to sit still, or I am going to come down there. I will. I I admit you're a much younger man than I am, a much larger man than I am, but trust me, if I if I put my mind to it, 
I can make your life a living hell. <laughs> so sit still. Yikes. Boy, I'm glad I'm in New Jersey. Yes, sir. <laughs> he, he can't do it. He can't do it. He cannot sit still. No. Those uh that uh, Sorry. yeah, so that headset it's <laughs> So, uh, Adam, why don't you tell Dave what happened to, at your house today? Um, while digging out the uh, the patio for the in front of the uh, waterfall, I uh, all of a sudden had a nice big long piece of cable hanging from the traco. Oh no! And, he- and um, instantly had no Wi-Fi. <laughs> oh no! Ah, uh, that's that's not a good feeling. <laughs> I ripped, I've done it good, man. I ripped it right out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're going to do it, you might as well go yeah. down in a blaze of glory. That's, uh, there was, yeah. in my young engineering career, we were doing soil sampling in New Brunswick, not far from the New Brunswick station, but this is back when I was an intern in college. And um, we hit an unmarked, thank God it was unmarked, but we hit an unmarked hot water force main between two buildings. Oh. And we had freaking Old Faithful in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> this new Brunswick building, and uh, yeah, it's it's not a good feeling when you when you come up with something you didn't expect. Well, when I uh, was yeah. working for a consulting company up in Ottawa, they were telling me there's a couple times we were working on uh, uh, federal property, and Ottawa is strange because there's like seven different levels of government up there, and got to get clearance here and there. But you know, the Department of Public Works had cleared uh, the drilling site, so uh, uh, the first time they uh, went down and they managed to hit a gas line and burn up the end of the rig uh, <laughs> because it wasn't marked. And they feel, oh, we didn't know that was there. Well, I want to trace it and find out. And then the second time, another clearance done. And it was only safe because uh, they were doing continuous split, poon, split spoons for the first 10 feet. So they got the first one done and they're taking the second one, clunk. Okay. Start digging another gas line that they hadn't located on their own property. They didn't know it was there. And two gas lines. That, that yeah. that's where stuff gets scary. Yeah, and like the first one, and it, it flared and burned the burned the tail end of the rig up. But the second one, they were lucky. They they felt the clunk when he went to drive the spoon, and they they hand dug and uh, called over the engineer from the Department of Public Works and says, uh, "What is that? <laughs> well, it looks like a gas line. How come it's not on the map and the clearance you gave us? Well, I don't know." You know, it's in, in, at least in the United States, when you when you get into that, there's there's always legal ramifications, and so yep. you, you you'd better hope you read the plans and they forgot to put it on there. And that's that's exactly <laughs> that's exactly what they done because they marked out the areas and they had they had cleared them all. So. What did you say it was a split spoon or something? Split spoon. It's what? a uh, it's a uh, metal tube. There's two uh, of them. Yes, there's two of them. Split spoon. Uh, it's a metal tube that's split in half and uh, about two and a half feet long, two, two and a half feet long. And, uh, you drive it, uh, with a hollow, with a uh, hollow stem auger rig. You, you drive it with a hammer down through the soil to, uh, uh, grab samples and also check the, uh, penetration of the soil, count how many blows it takes to go six inches, that type of thing. And then when you driven your two feet, you pull it out and unscrew the nose, unscrew the tail and, Split it open, get your sample out, and look at it, and take what ones you want, and screw it back together, and keep on going. Yeah, it was, that's exactly what I did for that internship, and I I had no idea how any of that worked beforehand, but that was that was a good experience to see how all that stuff goes together. Uh, but it sort of looks like a little well digger. It's one of those little trucks that has a almost a little truss rig that that'll uh, stand up at the back like a crane, and then it's got a, a it's not a huge hammer, but it's one of those vertical cable hammers, and the uh, the rig operator will trigger it to go up and down and pound this thing into the ground and then every two feet you can stop and pull a sample or you can just keep going for the penetration readings yeah. but it's, it's interesting stuff uh, huh. bruce i think wasn't it wasn't one of the first all i know all i know is that... go ahead go ahead go ahead adam go ahead adam what, what did you say oh, i was just gonna say all i know is all i know is if i've ever lose my job at the railroad my kids are gonna starve because nothing else sounds that cool <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you, you meet some pretty some pretty interesting characters who drive these trucks, man. It's yes, a, this is true. It's a it's a rough and tumble crowd show. It's it's, yeah. it's like the guys that do the plumbing for commuter railroads. It's it's a it's, <laughs> it's a rough and tumble crowd. Rough. Oh, he's moving again. What are you doing? Blowing your nose? <laughs> I have a podcast. They said it'll be fun. They said. 
Dick gets on his scrape their microphones all over the Who? street. Jesus, you, you guys, you guys are, you know, you're you're making this had a hard day. You gotta give him a break. He's just yeah, he's been traumatized by me? ripping out his internet. Well, the problem is, uh, Dave, that's a very uh, lovely thought. But right now, there's a fellow in uh, Western Australia driving a grader, uh, making the uh, making uh, many parts of Western Australia available to the to other uh, people, and he he needs to hear this. He doesn't want to hear every fourth word. He wants to hear every word. <laughs> oh, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> or there's a guy in New Zealand listening to it, or a guy in South America. Or South America. Well, there are lots of people in South there America are. actually listening. We to still, it. We still got the downloads from Vietnam coming in. Yeah, uh, you got their downloads. There's been downloaded in a, in uh, over a hundred countries or now around the world. Wow! <laughs> Congratulations, that's great. Yeah, that is that is great. Yeah, not that anybody can hear this one. <laughs> 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 so uh, the idea of this. Uh, so okay, tonight I got to introduce everybody. Uh, we have Bruce, the moderately agitated male boy. Uh, yes, we do. Are one of our all-time favorites. You've been here. Am I, am I an all-time favorite? I, absolutely. People talk about, you, ask me about you all the time. And as far as I'm concerned, you've been here since the beginning. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, you're in, you're engineering it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what I think? You got to turn your camera and give him that stern look. Yeah, maybe that's what I got to do. You got you got to give him the, the the evil stink eye look. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> Oh, that look, I see. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have our buddy. <laughs> what is that you're doing? Stop breathing. If that's breathing, stop breathing. <laughs> then we have, uh, yeah, and he's going to be mad. And the beauty of this, there, and now he's gone. Look at that. He's mad at me. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. I was just about to say, and he's going to get mad at me because I'm giving him a hard time. <laughs> And he left. That was, uh, by the way, that was Adam Pinellas who just left us, who lives in uh, Mapleton, Utah. And uh, he's gone now because I was giving him a hard time, I think. Or maybe he's gone to improve his internet. I better open, unlock the studio and just unlock the studio, let him back in. In case he comes back in. Yeah, exactly. So what's, uh, and finally, we have, uh, we also have with us is uh, Dave Abeles, all the way from uh, Lebanon, New Jersey. That's correct. Well done. Oh, he's back. Perfect. What did you do? I have no idea. Oh, that sounds that sounds a little better. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, oh, there I you go. Hey, can you uh, can you pin phone. your microphone to your shirt? Yeah, there you go. Pin your microphone to your shirt. Where is it? It'll be hanging down around it's your ears. Yeah, it's, ha- it's it's in it's an inline microphone. Oh, it's right. It's it doesn't even touch my shirt. Well, it's touching you, either. Okay, well, you got, it's important not to uh, either sit up straight or go under the bed or something. Because right, this is going to be, this. that's actually pretty good. Because this yeah, is going to, go ahead. I'm holding it right in front of me. There you go. That's perfect. So when you want to talk, remember to pick it up. Okay. Um, <laughs> We're going to make a good podcast out of this. So yeah, there we, uh, we're going to try. What? The, how, how far are we into the lunch now? The- we are, uh, we are now uh, 17 nautical miles downrange. At an altitude of uh, twenty two thousand feet. Wow! Eleven minutes, uh, twelve minutes into the into the flight, uh, uh, all systems are go. Uh, so Adam, so uh, you wanted that you and uh, you and Dave organized this podcast because Adam, you were excited to talk to Adam about stuff, and I said, "What kind of stuff do you guys have in common other than you're both a railway employees, which is a good railroad employees, which is I just thought of that all by myself." And uh, you, you started to tell me last night you have a whole bunch of people, of friends in common. G- give me a hint. Who are some of those? Well, I know we got one. Who? The the one the one the one that's most important to me right off the bat would be uh, Mark Hemphill. Okay. Yeah. And who's Mark Hemphill? Uh, uh, he was he was the editor for Trains Magazine through the eighties and early nineties. Oh yeah, I remember you telling me about him before, and didn't he end up going into uh, Full size railroading? Yeah, he he was a dispatcher. I can't remember what railroad he was dispatching for, I but think KCS. Um, yeah, yeah, it was. It was KCS. He was dispatcher for KCS, and then now he's a consultant uh, working on building a pretty big, uh, a brand new railroad here in the uh, UN basin, uh, hauling uh, like fracking materials and stuff. Hmm. What kind of basin? 
the it's the Uinta Basins, which is the mountain range in Utah. Oh, the Uinta. Uinta. Yep. U- Uinta. So, and how do you know Uinta. him? Uinta. Uinta. So, how do you know him, Dave? So, I, he he wrote an article in the July 1985 Trains magazine called "The Unknown Rio Grande." And mm-hmm. I, we we may have touched on it in one of our early podcasts, and I don't recall specifically if we did it, but I think we probably did because. For, for me, for a, a kid from a, a non-railroad family, uh, school teacher, dad, nurse, mom, you know, two kids that, that didn't hate trains, but, but you know, I was, I, was, I was the only one that was bitten by the bug. And July 1985, I would have been eight years old, and on the way to Boy Scout camp, which I didn't want to go to that particular year, uh, we stopped at the pharmacy, and, and there, here's this, this, cover, this cover feature in Trains Magazine. With a going away shot, looking down into what I l- later would learn as Ruby Canyon, in Colorado, on the Rio Grande, and it's a train going into the, you know, sort of a backlit, backlit situation, and it remains to my day, it to this day, it's it's my favorite piece of of railroad writing I've ever seen. Um, it it absolutely blew my mind as a young kid who'd never been out west and never seen the grandeur of the West, but loved the Rio Grande. I, I you know I, I don't know what little kid doesn't love the Rio Grande with the pictures and. The, you know, at that point, the ski train and all this stuff was still running, and you know, it was a powerful thing. So the editor, or the editor, excuse me, the, the author was Mark W. Hemphill. And so I, it's a name that was burned into my memory early. Later, he became, yeah, editor of Trains Magazine. I want to say, I don't know, out of mid-90s, maybe, to like the early 2000s? Something like that? Maybe. Maybe, I, yeah, something like that. It all kind of runs together. I, yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah, he, he, he was there. And he, so I, I actually, when he was editor of Trains, I wrote him a note. Uh, just it was actually I wrote him a thank you note uh, because you know it's it, he was the, my mom had passed away in '95 and that article became I mean I've, I've you know I've memorized most of it at this point because I've, I've read you know I've seen it a thousand times so I wrote him an article or wrote him a thank you note he got back to me and said oh I'm glad to see this, that article still inspires you know it was a lot of fun to write and there's a lot of good railroading out there still make sure you get out and take pictures and. You know, keep us posted on what you might find. And I, I never had anything published in trains. He wasn't he wasn't there long after that. Thank you. Note. Uh, and then he moved on and he was in consulting for years with HDR, one of the big international engineering firms doing transportation stuff. And, you know, I kind of lost track of him. And this is another classic Dave Abley story. So, <laughs> <laughs> nothing's ever short with me. So Rich Wisniewski, who works with me at NJ Transit, you guys know him well. And he's not that really that interesting, but carry That's, on. This is, this is what he keeps telling people, and I, I still say I beg to differ. Um, but sure enough, Rich Wisniewski says, ah, you know, this is five, six years ago. He says, ah, what are you doing this weekend? I said, oh, I'm going to be working on the layout a bit. And, um, yeah, I was going to I was going to go up to the, you know, there's a couple of people getting together at a tavern in Newark called McGovern's. And if you guys ever come down to the New York City area and COVID is lifted, we'll, we'll get over to talk about McGovern's because it's a great little Irish tavern in Newark. Great little place. It's been there since like 1939 or something. Um, but I said, uh, you know, he says, well, oh, yeah, I'm going out with a couple of people before that, too, but I probably won't come over to the McGovern's. I said, oh, I said, all right, well, who are you going out with? He's like, oh, my friend Matt Van Haddam. Uh, Rich and Matt have been talking since years and years ago because Matt was a New Jersey native before he started working for Trains Magazine with the mapping department. And his boss at HDR, uh, I think his name was, I think he, he has something to do with, with the hobby. He works at HDR. His name is Mark Hemphill. And I said, like, Mark W. Hemphill? And Rich was like, yeah, I, maybe. I mean, Matt said something about how I used to be editor of trains or something. I said, you're going to go out to dinner with Mark Hemphill? And Rich was like, well, yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, um, unless you're going to hate me afterwards, I'm coming. He says, well, uh, okay, I'm sure that'd be fine. And I said, well, you know, I don't want to trespass, but this guy's, this is this is one of the reasons that I'm, uh, that my mind, it, that it's, it's it, it was a definition. Like, since I was a young kid, this is one of the guys that defined the hobby for me. And sure enough, I met Mark, Mark Hemphill in the station that I managed, North Penn Station. And we went upstairs and talked in the office for a while, you know, and gave him sort of the backseat tour of, uh, of North Penn, the underground part of it, and the catwalks and all that stuff. And we, and we went from there. And it was, it was, so Mark and I, I, I was able, you know, we, we really did hit it off a bit. We stayed in touch and I ended up joining him at the Rio Grande convention when it was in Denver. I want to say that was 20, 2016. I had to look it up. The, right. the, the Rio Grande convention was, was reestablished for the first time in eight or nine years with the modeling and historical society. And they did it in Denver. So I ended up rooming with Mark 
in a suite. And we've, we've been in regular touch ever since. Um, and now <laughs> Mark Hempel says, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, we're talking about, he's, 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 he'll be retiring in the next couple of years, at least is the, the current estimate. And when he retires, he's talking about building a HO scale layout based on the Rio Grande, which to me is, you know, it's a natural fit, obviously based on my, my obsession with that article from 1985. And he grew up in Denver. He's loved the Rio Grande his whole life. Very good friends with Mel Patrick and, and uh, James Belmont and a, a bunch of the, you know, Chuck Conway, the guys that have defined Rio Grande photography in the modern generation. Uh, again, I mean, I'm sure Adam can agree. I, I, you know, for me, it, these are these are these are all legends in the hobby. You know, Mark Daneman, he knows all. Mike Daneman knows all those guys. And sure yeah. enough, like I met all of them at this Rio Grande convention in Denver, and it, it was like it was like a, a kid who loves baseball going to Hall of Fame weekend. Right. Like yeah. I'm sitting there, and I'm 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 staring at all of the guys that have taken the pictures that have defined my rail fanning passion. Everybody I've looked up to in photography and writing and it, it's you know our um rc fair rich farewell another one who wrote some rio grande books the whole uh, rio grande secret places series that was out a couple of years well at this point 20 years ago yeah and been a bit. just it's it's I, and he, and so mark was my gateway and rich was my gateway to mark and mark was my gateway to all these guys and then mark says yeah yeah i've, I've got a bunch of these brass steam engines and they're they're a pain in the rear end they you know they but that's okay because I got Adam Pinellas and he, he's gonna he's gonna fix them up for me. And I said, Adam Pinellas, this is a couple months ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he was here in Salt Lake City. And now that I moved down to Salt Lake, and you know, I, I, he's gonna help me out. And I said, Oh, Adam Pinellas. I go, oh, okay, I, I know that name for the podcast, and I've seen him on Facebook a couple times. All right, cool. And so I started to look at what Adam was doing, and I, I said, oh, Holy moly, yeah, Mark hempel has got the right guy if he wants smooth running brass <laughs> engines. This is, this is the dude you got to know, especially if you happen to live in Salt Lake City. Uh, so that that's the Mark Hempel connection. Mark Mark Hempel has actually been here to the OC one time, um, but he's just he he he, he took a, a a knife to my first couple chapters of the signal book that I wrote, the manuscript that's with Kalmbach now, and it came back more red than black. Right, and that's good because again, I mean, it's to have one of your literary heroes editing your first manuscript. I'll, yeah, I'm I'm okay with it. And he was even generous enough to write a sidebar for it. Oh, cool! So there should be a Mark Hemphill sidebar about uh, the Rio Grande's CTC. The Rio Grande had the second ever CTC installation at Tennessee Pass. Okay, so I, I've got a question for you, Dave. Now that you're hanging around with Mark and uh, Adam, when does the Conrail get ripped out and Rio Grande go in? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've I've got my Rio Grande coal train, and I and I've got. You know, since I was a kid, I've been collecting the engines. So I've, I've probably got, I don't know, 15 or 20 HO scale engines that are Rio Grande with a handful of SP as well. So it's, they, they, one of the beautiful, beautiful things about the Chicago line in the 90s was that it was rare, but it happened. I, I, I shot a Rio Grande tunnel motor leading a train once in 1997. Uh, Rio Grande GP40s would show up occasionally after the SP merger. So, I mean, all through the early 90s, it wasn't it wasn't uncommon for TV five five six or TV seventy nine to have a Rio Grande engine mixed in, so I can get a little bit of my fix that way. Yeah, it was crazy because over here during the early nineties, Conrail was like almost a second, a third, fourth railroad because there was so much Conrail stuff over here. And uh, I mean, I remember when the when the SD eighties came out. The, yep. I mean, those they were here. I mean, the Dash nine. We didn't really see. You know, what's funny is we didn't really see the Dash nines much. Or the Dash 8s. Dash 8s, yeah. Excuse me. The, yeah, the Dash 8s. We didn't see any Conrail Dash 8s, but I remember the, we uh, we saw the oddball GEs come on over here and the, you know, some, not to, pretty much just the GEs and the EMD, the SD 80s is what we saw. I, I vividly remember those SD 80s. Yeah, those were, and, those uh, were, those were really striking the way they were. Painted. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. I, I, I love it. They, they'd be on those, uh, Taconite trains a lot. Sure. Yeah, the ones that came through all the way from Chicago, right? They'd run them all yeah. the way out to Geneva yeah. that way. Yep. Yeah, I guess they were NS trains, but then Conrail interchanged them somehow. There was some sort of relationship there. And but, SP, I think, leased a handful of C thirty nine dash eights, yeah, and the C thirty two dash eights, but also a bunch of. I mean, SP leased a bunch of Conrail stuff in that ninety six ninety seven period before right. they got all their rebuilds. When Scale Trains brought out the the C thirty nine, that was one of the things that. I mean, I, with, um, with Shane, he's like, these aren't selling. I was like, I don't know why, because 
even though only two railroads had them, they were everywhere because they they got leased out like crazy. So I mean, you you saw those C thirty nines all over the place. Yeah, and boy, that scale train model is out <laughs> of this out of this world. I actually have. I mean, there was only twenty. No, I guess there was thirty of them on Conrail. Uh, yeah. And NS had a whole bunch. NS had like a hundred and forty or something like that. That was a huge engine for Norfolk Southern. But I, on my Conrail roster, I've got three, <laughs> which is like probably at least one more, if not two more, than I need. And if they come out with another run, I'll probably pick up another one because they're just they're just yeah, that they're just beautiful. nice engines. Yeah, yeah, they're nice. But uh, do you have any? Do you got SD eighties? Do you have any of them? I do not yet. I will. Good. I'm almost positive that I'm going to get a hold of one or two from Athern when they pop out here. And so, I don't know, like it's, it's tough. And it's, it's funny talking to you, Adam, because you, you, you know, your hand in the hobby is, is such a big one at this point. You know, you really have touched on so many different scales and so many different initiatives. And it's inspiring for somebody like me because I get to sort of vicariously appreciate all this other cool stuff <laughs> watching you do it. And for me, like I'm trying to stay focused because I just, there's so much cool stuff right now. Yeah, I'm not the one to follow. That's the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> but these, uh, but as I, since I try and focus on Conrail's mid '90s years, like '94, '95, the the SD80s were '96, right at the end of '96. I think they showed up. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, right, it was right right around there. It seemed like it was funny because it seemed like the SD90 showed up first. And then all of a sudden they went to the SD80 and I was like, Hey, isn't that a backwards move? Yeah. Right. It's just, that was EMD's confused years. It was, well, <laughs> it, was, it was when I think what happened is those SD nineties come out and they were boasting 8,000 horsepower and they just, you, it was too much. They were breaking trains like crazy. And so they deviated them to 6,000 horsepower or less. And then I think they, the next wave of them came out as just uh, redesignated as the eighties. And it was only Conrail that ever picked up the 80s. Yeah, that they, was they, it. But they were striking. And it, and the only other engines that were painted that way was the SD70 Max that mm-hmm. were actually CSX engines but delivered in Conrail paint right ahead of the merger. So there was there was that, that sort of like blending. Like my last couple of years at college, you had all these weird new engines showing up that were that were painted. And basically, it, they came with a CSX horn and CSX details, but they were right. painted Conrail quality. So, yes, yeah, so Hempel is one of them. But then... You know, it is the is the internet has has so changed the hobby. I mean, Bernie Kempinski, I know um, yeah. Adam, you and I crossed paths on his page a couple times. Yeah, Bernie. I, I, what's funny about Bernie is I've been friends with Bernie since like I want to say ninety seven or so, ninety eight. Wow. And and how I became friends with him was back in the Yahoo group days. I started a Yahoo group called DNRW N Scale, and. And he, he jumped in it and that's when he was building that Tennessee pass layout. But yeah. at the time he started, he started, uh, he really wanted to do a Utah layout because he had, so he had some pretty strong ties with Utah. And, the, and my dad had all the map. My, my dad has some crazy, crazy amount of information that, uh, for, for the Rio Grande, but what, in what he had, he had all the maps for Geneva still. Oh, and, wow. And so Bernie was like all horned up over that because you know how much he loves the steel mill type stuff. And so he was going to do Geneva Steel. And then when I sent him copies of all the maps, he was like, that is a massive, massive steel plan. Yeah. And yeah, it's big, man. Like, and I grew up looking at Geneva Steel every day. Like I grew up at the top of the hill and we looked down on Geneva. Wow. You know, and so I remember riding my bike, uh, you know, in the late eighties, every time you heard a horn, I could ride my bike as fast as I could to the, uh, to the edge of the hill and I could look down and I'd see the real grand trains passing or, you know, and I could tell which horns were which, you know, if there's a Union Pacific S3 or a Rio Grande M3 or whatever type of horn. And I, you could tell and I'd know where to look to, to, to find the train. And if it was a single chime, it was one of the Baldwin switchers in the Geneva plant, you know. God, so and awesome. it was, yeah, yeah, super cool, man. Like, so I could, I remember seeing that, all that growing up. And then, and then right when we moved from there, it was in the 92, 93, um, my my parents built a house in Mapleton, right in the mouth of Spanish Fork Canyon, and the Rio Grande main number one was like in my backyard, like a hundred feet off the back porch. That is a dream come true. Oh my so god! I, I had you know I had my dad's thirty five millimeter camera, and I used to just burn through film, taking pictures of every train that went by. And I finally stopped because I was just like, it, they're all all the pictures are the same when the the SP when the eight Cs showed up. Yep. Uh, yep. I I pretty much stopped taking pictures because it just became the same thing over and over and over and over. But I go back and look at all those pictures, man, and it was like 
the end of the Rio Grande schemes and then all the start of the Southern Pacific and all the mixed bag stuff that used to come through and the massive lumber trains that got shoved up the hill. And main one was the, is the steep side. Main two is the Utah railway side, which is a lot, which isn't quite as steep, but, uh, they, they'd start, they'd shove some massive trains up, up main so one and they, they'd yeah. cut the help, they'd cut the helps in in Provo if they were going up main one. And if they were going up main two, they'd usually cut them in uh, at a place called Castilla up the half, you know, right in the mouth of the Canyon. Yep. No, I, I know both. And I was fortunate. I actually had a girlfriend who was just a traveler and she came from a family where like, there wasn't a whole lot of, not a whole lot of consistency at home. And so she was, was an early traveler between her parents, two places and flying around quite a bit was very proficient with all that. And as a teenager, you know, it, you guys have all heard the story now that we had a bunch of sickness at home and my mom had passed away when I was a senior in high school. So there wasn't a whole lot of traveling going on in those in the nineties for me, uh, because just because of that stuff, we, we done a lot as a family in the eighties, but by the end of the nineties, things had calmed down a little bit. And by the two thousands, you know, my, my girlfriend was like, well, you know, you know, you should really get out there and see some of this, go out and see some of these trains. And she's like, I said, well, yeah, but I didn't even know what to do. She's like, well, I'll help you out. And sure enough, like it was, it was right at that time that the, the cruise and helper, the mechanical yeah. guys had figured out how to sort of sleepwalk the union Pacific into having like <laughs> 15 Rio Grande engines based out of helper. Yeah. And so Barb was like, let's go. So in April of 1999, I took, uh, no, excuse me. April of 2000 was the first time I did it. So I was just, just, I had just started to work at transit the following the, 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 the uh, fall before. And I had, I think I used a whole week of vacation of my two weeks. And at that point, you know, it was absurd. It was like $230 round trip from Newark to Salt Lake City. And we flew out, rented a car in Salt Lake, drove over Soldier Summit. My first time ever on Soldier Summit. I'd, I'd been out west with my family to Denver and we'd done the Four Corners, but I hadn't actually followed the Rio Grande. So we, we drove up to Glenwood Springs in 1989 oh. and then drove down through like, you know, down through the Canyon country and, and what have you, right. down, you know, Durango and Silverton, what have you. But it's for the first time being out in the my, what I call the Rio Grande Desert, which is what Mark Hemphill wrote about in '85, was this trip with 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 a girlfriend, and we we drove over Soldier Summit at night and saw four or five trains right through Spanish Fork Canyon, right through Castilla. I mean, I went right I went right by your parents' house. I'm sure. Oh, you, you know? did, yeah. And yeah, we, we you know, US 650 up over the hill, and yeah. we spent four or five days. Like, I basically for myself recreated what Mark Hemphill wrote in 85 in that magazine article for my own psyche based out, except for me, it was based out of helper because it was the only place that had the Rio right. Grande engines. So then we chased right. the dirt train. We chased the Utah coal trains West with union Pacific help and, and with Utah help, I should say union Pacific power, but uh Utah oh. railway help, including the freaking F 45 and all those yeah. SP40s. Oh, I love um, them. oh my God. Awesome. I mean, for, for a kid from New Jersey where, Helpers are what you see in Crescent, Pennsylvania. It's a pair of SD forty dash twos, and if you're really lucky, it's two pairs of SD forty dash twos. Uh huh. It's, <laughs> it's not come over eight. here. Come over here and see eight <laughs> locomotives. It's in not the eight. Of a train. <laughs> <laughs> Holy yeah. moly! Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, the only thing cooler than actually seeing that is running them. <laughs> dude, I I can. It gives me chills to even think about that. Like I get I get Facebook memories every once in a while, and I had one pop up the other day, and it says. This is back when we could have phones on the train, you know. Sure. And uh, it said, "Well, it's going to be a long day. I'm doing uh, 11 miles an hour, and the bells are ringing." <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and I could, I could, I took me back to. I was right there coming up to to Nolan Nolan Tunnels, right, right on the meat of the grade. Yep. Right there when it's the heaviest, man. Yep. Like just under three percent. And uh, you know, I got, I was on the helps. I didn't work the helps very much, but. But uh, when I was on the helps, it was it was an experience, man. It was uh, it was all sorts of fun. And I, I knew you worked for the Utah, but what years? I worked for the Utah, and I started in 2007, okay. and uh, and then went to 2012 when I jumped over to Amtrak. So I just missed the 40s, but I I grew up riding on them. Like I all the I was friends with sure. everybody. Oh, I was sure. in my backyard, you know. It was no big deal and back then. Yeah, I it was mean, no big deal. We all got cab rides back then because, I mean, my first cab ride was in Manville. The, the, the local mechanic showed up on a Sunday afternoon, and instead of getting yelled at, he's like, do you guys want to take a ride? And we're like, oh, my God, yes. You know, <laughs> obviously, yeah. kids. Yeah. And up, we, up, I mean, we knew everybody. It's a small knit community. A lot of the guys that, that worked out of Provo, they lived in Mapleton or they lived in, you know, in close close proximity 
to do here. So, I mean, I, I, we, I knew the guys, I yeah. knew them really well, you know? So it was, it wasn't hard at all. Oh, man. <laughs> awesome. And, uh, so yeah, yeah. My, my, my dream was to like, just to work trains on soldier summit. I wanted to work for the Rio Grande, but you know, didn't get that opportunity. I, I ended up going to the BNSF in the fall of 2000 when I turned 18 Okay, and, uh, and it worked my, finally worked my way back, took seven years to get back to Utah but I ended up at Utah Railway, which I thought was just, you know, uh, just destiny, you know, like it was crazy. No, it's, so. it's, it's interesting because, you know, when my, my only ride in the helper's experience, just to get that comment in, was outside this, again, this little place called Crescent, Pennsylvania, which is about, ah, it's 12 or 15 miles railroad west of Horseshoe Curve in Pennsylvania. So w- between, between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. And it's right on the meat of the Allegheny grades where the PRR crossed the Allegheny mountains, which is a legendary yeah. all to itself. Um, but the, the, the branch lines out of Crescent up into the mountains to go to the coal mines, which were very active until, until recently, really. And it's coal. So it, uh, it's like any, any coal, it ebbs and flows five years, no trains, weeds. Then the railroad yeah. comes back, lays all new rail, new tie, you know, they, and they, they run for three or four years. They run coal trains like there's nothing, no tomorrow. And then it's back off again. <laughs> it's just, it's just boom and bust. But when they were running, this company called RJ Corman, uh, mm-hmm. which was based out of Kentucky and ended up operating these, these branch lines out of Crescent, did it with all sorts of crazy old EMD power. And they, they'd run through some of the NS stuff because this is after Con, really Conrail sold it in like 96. But yeah. then there was really very little traffic on it until the 2000s, until after the Conrail merger, whenever they were split up. So around 2007, 2008, um, you know, we, we, we would go out there every summer for a long weekend. Me and all my buddies would, you know, drink beer, watch trains, just that sort of an, it became, it's become sort of a guy's retreat. We've done it every year for 26 years. Um, but that particular year, the owner of the inn knew someone at Corman, the road foreman. And the guys like, well, you know, if you got a couple of guys that are responsible that want to ride, just go down and ask the engineer at the mine and it should be no problem. So sure enough, you know, 15 of us go down there <laughs> and the guy's like, sure. And of course, it's, you know, you're talking GP 38s, uh, one GP 35, uh, a couple SD 40s, and then just a mix of older EMDs that were on these crazy, you know, 16 degree curves and 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 two and a half percent grades back in the woods in pennsylvania and we so we all there's five engines we filled up we filled up the whole every cab on the on the train had edge had us in it right and to 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 be on a loaded coal train going up that kind of route it's it's intense it's the only thing i can imagine that would compare to what what you're talking about on the utah that's just awesome yeah right when i left i mean i during my time at Utah, it seemed like, uh, I, I mean, I worked a lot of the little uh, branch lines or the little yard jobs and road switchers that they had that they acquired in 2007, but or 97, excuse me. Um, but they, I ended up being the only person, how it flowed down, I ended up being the only person on the Provo Extra Board, as engineer uh, qualified on the hill. So I brought, I used to bring trains when they were busy. I'd, I'd, I'd go dog catch three trains a day. Wow. From summit and bring it down. You know, I was bringing three trains a day off the hill, you know, and it, I was, I, I made sure that every one of my rail fan buddies got to ride with me at least once, you know, and then when I, when I knew that I was leaving, I made sure I tried to get everybody I, that I knew wanted an opportunity to ride to come with me. Sure. You know, but this was, I mean, this was in like 2012. And to think about it now, it's like, no, the NKs are gone now, you know, and the NKs became legendary with the Utah Railway as sure. much as the 40s of the RSD 15s, you know, or RSD 45s. Oh, and the RSD 15s too, the Gators. Oh, the I mean, Gators. every, every, every locomotive the Utah Railway has had has become a legendary locomotive as far as, you know, coal hauling in the Wasatch Mountains. And including RSD 50 S's. Yeah. What's awesome those are, is that there, those, there's a few of those still out there. Those are cool right. looking engines, man. I love yep. those things. Yeah, they're like the only yeah. one that survived that you know, the, the last couple of generations really intact. Oh, the RSD, the uh, the oh, the Alcos, the three hundreds. No, the the SD fifty S's. The the oh the, yeah yeah the Australian yeah, still SD50s. down here. Yeah, the, yeah, 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 the Hammersley guys, right, right. Yeah, yeah, with the, with, still... the, with the, the double roofed cab. It's just a cool yeah, looking. Right. I mean, for de- for details, guys like you and I, it, it's it's it's, it's, it, they're it's iconic, different. very different. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah, they're different. They were some of the last ones. They had a really long horn valve, man. You could make those things sing like nobody's business. <laughs> I love hearing details and they like had, that. 
and they had five chines on them. You know, most of them had five chines. I've got one in my garage, actually. Oh, had, dude. But, uh, but they had these huge five chimes on them, and they never really sounded like a five chime because the air valve on it was so, like, it took, when you pulled that air valve all the way open, it took a good four or five seconds for the full amount of pressure to hit the horn. It was weird. <laughs> Wow, you kind of had to play that by ear then. Oh, yeah, literally. Man, you had to, you could play that thing. You could make that thing sing. So cool. So cool. But, ah, I love it. I love it. Yeah. See, in, in stations maintenance, there's just nothing that cool to talk about. I, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a good job. It lets me come home at night to my – that's the big thing. It's lets me come home at night to my kids uh, right. and, and to the on and dog cut off, which is, you know, which is a pleasure, obviously, and to do things like this, which is a pleasure. But – um. So that's got to be quite a shift in gears then for you to go from from Hogan for the Utah over to Amtrak as a conductor. Well, it, you know it was, and originally I was I was planning on going back to the sharp end of the train anyway. Like I was, my full intention was to go back into engine service, and uh, but it didn't take long for me to realize that why would I leave the gig that I've got going on right now, man? Like this is awesome. I and what what honestly set what what, what set it in concrete for me. Was we were coming up uh, up the uh, up Price Canyon, and a couple we we started pacing the Utah train for a minute, right? And I'm in the dining car drinking coffee, eating crab cakes, you know, <laughs> get, getting paid. And my buddy, my buddy Joey was on the was on the Utah train, and I looked over and I saw him. I was like, so I got on my radio and I started talking to him. I was like, hey, buddy, what's up? You know, blah, blah, how you doing? Oh, just another day, you know, blah blah blah. Oh, that sounds like a great time. I remember how miserable I used to be. I, I man, I used to smoke a pack of cigarettes a day. You know, just because it was so boring. Just after a while, it became just a, a monotonous thing to do, you know? Yeah, and, uh, for sure. Yep. And and I remember sitting there thinking, I was like, man, that is horrible. I remember that. And I said, well, have a good one. We're out of here. I'm uh, I'm going to enjoy these crab cakes. Have a good one. You know? And I, I realized right then, I was like, why would I give up this gig? I'm already retired. Yeah, you know? see, fair and enough. So I was just, you know, I had no. And here's the other thing. I. I enjoy running trains. I enjoy in being in the locomotive, operating, you know, making the thing move, doing, doing the whole, the whole bit. I, once you do it, you don't really enjoy it anymore. So being removed from it, I look forward to every time I have to go up there. Yeah. Roger that. I, that, I could, I could see that. Yep. You know, I could see that. So it's like, you know, it's an escape for a minute from, from my office, from the train, from, from that life. And I can go back to my old life. And I'm, you know, I'm just as good today as I was then, if not better, because this train only weighs 2,500 tons versus mm-hmm. 15,000 tons, you know, sure. I mean, sure. it's, it's a big difference, but it's, it's, I, I look forward to it every time I have to go up there or I get to go up there or whatever the situation is, it's, it's enjoyable, you know, and I'm not stuck there. I don't have to be there, but I get to be there, you know, and so. So I, 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 I just finally put it all together. I said, you know what? I've got the best of everything right now. See, uh, yeah. oh, uh, Adam Penelis, when, yeah. dri- when you were driving the trains, uh-huh. uh, you must have had some, let's say, exciting moments, for lack of a better term. Uh, what was the most exciting moment you had while you were uh, at the head end? Oh, man. Um yeah, we, I don't know what type of excitement do you want. Like, yeah, I was just going to say there, there are there are different terms, Bruce, but probably well, yeah, we yeah, but we're, we're, on a, we're on a we're on a public we're podcast, on a public right? podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you yeah. can say, say which ones had the highest pucker factor, you know? Okay, so I I remember this one time I was coming over, uh, and in fact this is this is one of the experiences I used in my Amtrak interview actually because they told me the question in the interview was. When was the time that you had to make a split second decision and you didn't know if it was going to be the right decision or not? And, uh, you know, and it, it was one of those things where he answered like, well, this is the split second decision I made, but I knew it was the right answer, even though it was going to affect somebody negatively, but it was still just the safest thing to do. I was coming over the hill on a uh, coal train. So we hit summit. Everything's going good. Um, we cut the helps out at Colton, which is about, uh, Oh, a couple miles east of Soldier Summit. And that, that's where we cut the helps out because the grade from there is still steep, but not quite as bad. We don't need the helps to get up there all the way. And, uh, but what was the only difference this time is we didn't have, uh, distributed power very much on the train, on our trains, but this one did. And, uh, so it was a U, so it had UP power. It was destined for a UP. Um, but it was headed down the UP line. So it had UP power on the, on the front end and it had UP power on the back end. Um, linked up and our helps were 
in the middle. I had a five unit set of helps that we uh, cut out. Once we've got the train back together and um, we got up to summit, I get, I'm starting to get ready to uh, crest the grade. Well, I'm playing around with my DPUs. I've got uh, what they call back the old style DPU, the one of the original ways, instead of it being integrated in the, into the, uh, uh, computer of the locomotive. It was an addi- add on and they called it a Harris box. It was this big, big box that sat up on top of the dash and, uh, it kind of had the, the graphics of an old Atari game, but it, it but it, the, but they call it the fence and you can, you can, you can divide your power up to where you can run your front end and your rear end at the same time just by the controls or you can set, put the fence up and control your front end with the controls and your rear end by push buttons on the, uh, on the Harris box. And so I was like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going uphill. Like, you know, let's, let's play around with this for a second. I want to see what I can do. And I ended up trying to keep my train bunched up. So I started going into dynamics in the head end. The rule to go off, off, off soldier summit was you had to crest the grade at 10 miles an hour and you had to check your train and checking your train meant, that you had to make sure that you had it gathered up, you had your brakes set, you had control of it. Everything bunched together, have, right? Yeah, you didn't, you didn't have, you didn't, you weren't using excessive dynamic brakes, and you weren't using excessive air. You know, you everything, you had a, a fine balance going on, and you were in control. And at first, I was in check, I was good. I'm like, all right, cool. And all of a sudden, I lost communications with my DP. Well, right before that, to keep my train bunched up, I decided to to uh, shove on them from the rear. Well, I went into dynamics in the front. And I was going to keep my train bunched up. <laughs> and uh, right then I lost communication with the, with the, with the rear end. So you're up you know, to notch. Sudden, what, on the back end, how, what, you're up at like six, seven, eight? No, I was like three or four maybe. You but, know, still, but still right pushing there. over the oh, top. Oh, yeah. I was pushing. And right then I looked up and all of a sudden it went beep, beep. You know, and it said no, no call. And I was like, oh, oh, no. And uh, right then I looked over <laughs> and I said, hold on. And it. You, it felt like the rug was swept out from underneath us because that, that run in from that train, those locomotives were pushing us off the mountain and it, it just came in and it literally felt like the train was taken right out from underneath our feet. Whoa. And uh, right then I instantly went from 10 miles an hour to like 18 miles an hour. And I looked over at my conductor and I said, uh, I'm, I, I'm plugging it, man. And, and uh, cause I knew there was no way I was going to get it back. There's absolutely no way. And, uh, and he, and Justin, he was my, he, uh, plug it. So I plugged it and I knew it's horrible because now my half, most of my trains on the grade and we're going to die now because not literally uh, die on the law. Well, I hope we didn't at that time. I didn't really know what was going to happen, but, but, um, fortunately we ended up getting stopped. It took about two and a half miles or so to uh, get stopped and we were doing 15 miles an hour. Um, thank God. It, uh, thank God. See, if you <laughs> waited, if you waited 30 seconds. Yeah. It's that. It's that split second thing, you know, yeah. it's like you got to know what to do right when you do need to do it. And, and it was the, the thing that the only thing that really made me not want to and try to get it under control was I knew that his, his name was Preston. It was Justin's brother that was with me. But I, I looked at Preston. And I said, I'm sorry, dude. I owe you, I owe you a stake and a beer because you got to tie this whole train down, you know, like because yeah. we're on the hill. And sure. I've got to tie the entire thing down, pump it up, set, reset my brakes, get everything set to where and then have them knock all the brakes off. And then start going again, but that was that was probably the most pucker factor I've ever had. Now this look, you put enough power on a train, you're going to get over the hill. That's a fact every single time. But gravity has no friends, and you screw up, or the comm screws up, or you know this is this is the problem with PSR and with all of this this modern technology. It's great when it works, but when yeah. it doesn't, it's dangerous, dangerous. Right. Right. What's PSR? That's the um, you know I mean, precision precision scheduled railroading, which basically is class one speak for cost cutting to the point where you're cutting your arm off to your. Uh, so instead of running two eight thousand ton trains, you're running one twenty four thousand ton train because you skip it for a day and make sure that you can you know you put mid train helpers in. So the engineer now is controlling his head end, slaves in the yeah. middle, and rear end helpers. Two sets yeah. of DPUs. Yeah. And it's and at that at that point you just drop the fence and control them all at the same time. Yeah, and that's I just, mean uh, to me, I've never I've never had a I've never had a train that big or that much power. So I don't I'm not entirely sure but but my logical mind says I'm not even gonna try to fence these off. 
No, I just, and to me, like you know, there's just look, there's a, there's a limit to how far you can take this yeah. stuff, and unfortunately, um, you know, in America, Wall Street, Wall Street sees one thing and one thing only, and that is profit, and nothing yeah. else matters. So, and, so Adam, uh, when you were having your incident, uh, were you able to get contact with the rear units again? Yeah, once once it went into emergency, it triggered it. It, it they went into emergency as well. So. It, uh, the, the nice thing is, is even if you had communication or not, when, when the, there, there's a valve in the, in the locomotive, in the, in the air brakes called the PCS valve, which is a power control switch. Well, um, and we, we, the power down. We, so we lost to start again there about that. Can, can you hear me now? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You can hear me or you can't hear me. We, we can, can hear you. You just go over the part about PCS again. All right, so in a locomotive, in part of the air brake uh, system, there's a switch called the the PCS switch, which is a it's sh- uh, short for power control switch, and that that right there is uh, senses your your emergency applications. So when your PCS is open, um, it shuts all the power down to your locomotive, starts the standards and everything. So uh, so when in regardless of what notch those locomotives were in, and communication non communication, the the nice thing about the air brakes, as far as the actual train, is that's still pretty uh, mechanical. Um, versus once you get to the locomotive, it's uh, electronic. But you know, behind the locomotives and in the train, it's still very much so mechanical. And once that switch opens in the locomotive, it it shuts the power off. Bruce, weren't we talking about PSR uh, with Hunter Harrison there the other day with somebody? Somebody I was talking. To, well, he was the guy. It wasn't, that, it wasn't, it wasn't me. Oh, okay, but so, he was the guy that started that, wasn't it? The precision scheduled railroading. Uh, they, he may have been one of the one who really pushed it. Yeah, I thought he was the guy that kind of everybody got all bent out of shape because. Oh he, yeah, we were. I know we were talking to uh, the guy out west. Yeah, Norm Skettering. Yeah, you were there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Don't be saying you weren't there when you were there. Am I on? Have I'm? Have I? Am I still part of this or? <laughs> I don't know, are you? <laughs> yeah, but I thought I, isn't isn't uh Dave, you you're you brought it up, uh precision scale railroading. Isn't isn't Hunter Harrison the guy main guy responsible for all that? Yeah, that's been the discussion is that he um you know, he he on the Illinois Central, the rumor has it that he uh you know noticed a, a yard that was empty or that was full and he said it was good business and his supervisor said no, it's just a bunch of revenue sitting around. You know, no, nobody makes any money in the yard, and so that's the legendary start of it for him. And went on to be sort of the the leader of this this new movement of precision scheduled railroading, which basically means that you schedule each train to to leave at a certain time and arrive at a certain time. You combine as much of them as possible to these gigantic freight trains, uh, right at the limit of the locomotives, and you build your entire operating plan around that schedule. And I, you know, it's, he, he's, he's definitely the guy that is credited with being sort of the, the grandfather of PSR for, yeah, for, for what it's worth. Um, and it's, and, and look what happened he, to him. Well, right. And then you know, he worked, worked for a bunch of railroads at the top spot, got very, very rich. And then yeah, his, he, uh, he, he was passed rich. away in spectacular fashion. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened to him? I don't, what's the spectacular fashion? Well, he, he was, bunch of legal battles and he wasn't allowed to work for cp because he worked for cn and then he did anyway and then ended up at, at um did he come CS- down to, yeah CSX, he came down to okay. csx i yeah. think right yeah. and it was just it was just a, a bunch of a boardroom CSX. battles and 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 then, and then and then he had some long horrible drawn out illness that, that that finally put him under i mean you know dragging around an oxygen tank and the poor guy the, the, yuck <laughs> It was the most celebrated death that I have ever witnessed personally in my life. Like I've never seen somebody's death be celebrated like that. Now, there's a lot of railroaders never. that really resented what he did, and I I would argue rightfully so. It, it's 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 proved out to be a wonderful thing for shareholders, uh, but but a really not not a good thing for the industry, in my opinion. Hey Bruce, I bet you wouldn't never would have guessed that before we got halfway through 2020, we we'd bring up Har- Harold Ballard twice, eh? No kidding. <laughs> you guys, <laughs> you guys probably neither of you guys know who Harold Ballard is. He was the most celebrated death in in the in the in history, I think, in Toronto. Anyways, he was the owner of the Toronto Maple Leafs that just decimated it and huh. 
and gutted it and turned it into just a laughing stock. So and it's it's sad, and that's that's exactly what I. And you know, it's funny because again, the shareholders, you know, the, the 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 capitalist people that fund these railroads, they they love it. The share price is up. You know, the, the railroads only moving profitable freight. But when you look at railroads as a public benefit, and that's something that both Adam and I can agree on because we both work for passenger companies that are subsidized. So we're providing a public service for what we do. And I would argue that there was a need for public service to some degree from the freight railroads as well. And right now, there's a lot more trucks on the highway because because of the way, you know, the way these railroads are being run. So it's it's a frustrating time. Uh, you know, that kind of cost cutting doesn't leave a lot of room for you know, progressive or healthy management. Okay, so and, and, and it doesn't leave a lot of ha- happy employees either. It, it, so it, I, it's oh, a I, I, I have a friend who was a conductor on CP, retired uh, not long ago, and uh, he had nothing good to say about Hunter. The, the, every all the employees oh, yeah, loathed the man. So, yep. I, so explain to me how it ended up. Be, <laughs> explain to me how. <laughs> Explain to me how uh, um, it ended up being the, the railroads, because I, I understood it to be like his big thing was like there'd be dedicated intermodal trains. And then he came along and said, you know what, there's other freight in the in the yard. Let's just throw all the freight into the, into the intermodal train and we'll just make one big train rather than have dedicated trains for intermodal and dedicated trains for this. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's kind of the way I understood what happened. So how did that end up increasing truck traffic like how did that take freight away from the railroads they- well the, you know the, the way the way i've seen it and again look some you know to some degree there's there's nothing wrong nobody with gets, moving the freight that's gets, in the lane go ahead they're good go ahead adam good. go ahead anyway no i uh i i see the truck traffic um picking up mostly just because people have a lot of a lot of shippers have multiple options to ship and if they need their goods or their product now they're going to do whatever they got to do to get it now. And if that means moving over to a truck, that means moving over to a truck. And and did part of precision scheduled railroading, did it start, did the, did the freight start to move slower? Maybe is that a possibility? Is that what when you have, when, when you're, a, when you, I think when you're a smaller shipper of a, a massive intermodal train and you're waiting for that box car, but it doesn't matter because everything around it is more important. It, it, it get, I'm sure, here it can become pretty frustrating as a shipper saying, well, I need my box car. Well, everybody else needs everything else too. And it's in this train that's sitting, you know, here waiting on a crew or sitting over there waiting on a crew or whatever, or it's broke down in a train that's two miles long and have one guy have to walk it four times. You know, I mean, it's, yeah, I can only imagine how frustrating that could end up being, you know? All right. Yeah, and then they also end up cutting a lot of the local services as well and spinning them off because they, didn't want anything to do with them, and they raised the rates. So what they what they did on on the on the traffic that was that was lower lower profit, uh, the car load stuff primarily was because now railroads can adjust their rates. There's no there's no you know oversight for that. I mean it's it's all contract basis. So now they they would they would raise their rates to the point where it didn't make sense for a shipper to use the railroad anymore. They just they would rather because it's, if it's as expensive as a truck, the truck is definitely more consistent over time. Because there's no classification yard. Truck is, you know, origin to destination, end of story. So a lot of the lower priced freight that used to ride piggyback trains or stack trains was raised to a point where the truck said, where the, where the, the, the company said, look, I'm just going to, uh, I'm also ship it on truck if it's going to be the same cost. You see a lot of the lower, lower profit stuff shedded. And the theory, and it's, a, it's not a, it's not a, not a terrible theory. The theory is that railroads have fixed capacity. So the, the less low-cost freight you have, the more high-cost stuff you can haul consistently. But the railroads took it further under PSR and combined every train. So that, you know, instead of, instead, you know, at a, at a Camelton, New Brunswick or, or um, Halifax, Nova Scotia, like now CN used to run three trains west out of there daily. And now there's one. And it's, you know, 18,000 feet long, 26,000 tons. And it's... Because you you know, but the piggyback trains they used to run more quickly. They used to be scheduled to run more quickly because the, the equipment could be handled more quickly. Now, if that's in the, if that's in a train with a bunch of lumber cars and coal hoppers, it, you know everything slogs along you know right right at the the, 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 the tonnage limit. So yeah, it, it's it's a different model. And you know, look, I mean, it is what it is. I'm not 
my, my opinion is not going to change any of it. But I, what I feel for is these guys like, you know, like Adam or um, you know, Adam was talking about going over the summit. You go over the summit with a, a an eight or 10,000 ton train, you can get it stopped on the hill there where something goes wrong. You go over the summit with a three mile long, 26,000 ton train and something goes wrong at 15 miles an hour. <laughs> That's a different story now. You know, you the, know, the beautiful part about that is they over here on the, on some, on soldier summit here, they've actually got to the point where they limited them that you can't, you can't have a train longer or heavier than this because they had a track. It wasn't too long ago, actually, when they did try to run one of those monsters over it and it ended up kicking the, kicking the track out almost a foot and a half in, in some, in some right around that, you know, where I'm talking the lower Galilee loop. That goes oh yeah. yeah. Oh, well, right highway. under, under us six under the highway. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tight right there, corner. It knocked, yeah, it knocked that track out almost a foot and a half on the on the apex of that curve. Whoa! And I mean, you can't you can't fight physics. Nope. You know, I mean, you had that much you had that much coming in on it, and it just it just did it. It just I mean, you can you can wish in one hand, you know, and uh, and you'll know what you're getting in the other because it you just can't. You, you, there's a, there's a certain point to it that you just can't do it anymore. You know. Nah, gravity has no friends. It it it, it needs to be. It needs to be a reasonable amount of force and a reasonable amount of resistance. It's, 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 ba- it is, it's basic physics. It is what it is. Yeah, it's, it's interesting stuff. I mean, and look, you know, the industry is always changing. I mean, the, one, one of the, the only real constant with railroading has been, you know, ties, rails, and change. <laughs> Everything else seems to roll and, and it, you know, it, it just has to be what it has to be. So, you know, we'll see how it goes, but it's, uh, it's certainly interesting talking to Adam about, you know, the, the physics of train movement and, you know, but then, you know, the, the other, the flip side of it is what we both do now with the passenger service. I mean, this whole COVID thing, this whole, you know, pandemic has really for the first time in a long, long time changed passenger railroading. And when, when, when you talk about passenger railroading, like one of the things that it, it counts on is that, is that consistent demand. So whether it's commuter trains on NJ transit or summer vacationers on the California Zephyr, the service is designed around that demand to, so that you never exceed it and so that it's very consistent. Yeah, and I would say it's probably going to affect New Jersey Transit more than the long haul trains because you're designed as a mass transit when that implies moving a mass of people yeah. on, with some given equipment. So, you know, there's that whole how do you handle that? And No, uh, we're, we're in trouble. It. We're in trouble. Look, I mean, it, you know, we've gone from 97% disappearance of our riders. Uh, we're up, we're back to about 92 or 93% in the last week. So we've gone from, you know, two or 3,000 riders a day. We're up around eight or 10,000 riders a day now. Uh, so there's a slow trickle back, but it's a long road to come. And when 50% of your company is, is founded on revenue dollars from, from passengers and another 20% is founded upon advertising that is sold to those passengers where the contract allows the advertisers a way out. If there's nobody riding, well, you know, here we are. <laughs> so, yeah, transit's in a tough spot. But, I mean, I, and Adam can speak to Amtrak. I mean, I, I, I'm, I told my wife today, I said, you know, this might be the summer. Maybe, maybe we should change our plans and book an Amtrak trip across the country because I don't think anybody else is going to be riding. Oh, you'd have, a, you'd have a definite experience, that's for sure. <laughs> that's one way of saying it. Um. So, Dave, I just wanted to say when we were talking about uh, precision scale railroading, you were just saying, uh, you're just tr- trying to say, well, it's just kind of my opinion. But I think the thing you got to remember is you guys know a lot of people wouldn't know what you're talking about, which is really what's important about the podcast. So, I guess my point is it really doesn't matter whether you agree or not. The fun part is explaining to people what it is. Does that make sense? It sure does. Okay. Yep. So, no, get, I- go ahead. No, I, 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 and I appreciate your guidance on that. Yeah, it's like writing a signal book. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> doesn't oh, matter. Boy, doesn't matter if you know it. You got to explain it to everybody else. Yeah, I learn. I'm learning that one the hard way. It's a, <laughs> it's, <laughs> you know, get, what, it's an adventure. Go ahead, Adam. Get, getting getting back to model railroading, it baffles my mind how anybody could model modern because if you were modeling today. You, I mean, or the last year, how do you have a HO scale train that's 240 cars long? I mean, how do you do that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's 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 a really tough selective compression. 
Well, yeah. I, don't get me started on that subject. That's one of my favorite bugaboos about uh, guys that are say they're they're modeling a such and such a railroad, and you know they're 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 being so careful to model it. But really, once you get to the layout part of the of the layout of the model railroad, you can't model the railroad. All you can do is model the the locomotives and the cars, and everything else becomes an impression of what you think it would be. And that's why the whole prototype modeling movement, I think, needs to be a little gentle in general. Because, guys, we all make big compromises, big compromises, and and that's good. There's nothing wrong with it. That's we're all having fun, and that's the point of this whole thing: is fun and community. Community to me is is the central part of the hobby. So. Why are you condemning somebody for having a fictional route when all of your curves go the wrong direction in your scenes? Or when you, you know, your, your 80 car CNO coal train is a 20 car CNO coal train and you call that a mainline train? No, it's not a mainline train. It's a, that's the local at best. Right. So, but that, that said, look, I mean, but, but it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If, if you want the camaraderie of an operating session, it doesn't matter how long your trains are. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, don't get me started on that subject. Like, were you sent to me by an angel or something? Because I've been saying that for the last 30 years. Prototype modelers need to be gentler rather than jam it down everybody's throat that it's the only way to do it. It's not the only way to do it. It's a hobby, guys. Come on. Come on. Lionel, when are you coming to the OC? When are you going to? When are you, are you? I'm coming. I said as soon as you have an operating session. I, I mean, I've got a couple of guys that are willing to jump in the fray now. We can certainly have a remote dispatcher, uh, as, as we've talked about before. But I, I, I would say, you know, look, I mean, I think sooner than later, I'm, I'm going to say September at the latest. Well, then I'll, uh, be, then I'll be there. Second Saturday of September. All right. Yeah, with the, the border's open. There you go. Yeah, you know, if, I know. And if the, yeah, and he needs a fire escape, too. I got it, Bruce. <laughs> now, Bruce, are you coming, uh, too? I'm, I might eat, I, we could probably arrange something, yeah. And Adam, if you can arrange it, come on east, buddy. I got look. I got oh, a man. couple. I got a couple guest beds. We got a hotel right across town. I got. I got basically an unlimited supply of beer. Let's. let's well, now, now we're talking. Yeah. Let's say, let's say no more. Let's run. Say some, no more. <laughs> let's run some trains. I, second, the second, the weekend after Labor Day. I, I'm not even I'm not good at my calendar. Uh, if I glance at it quick, let me just take a quick look here. Just to see what we're dealing with, and maybe, maybe we, you know, barring, I mean, look, if the, if the whole world falls apart, we got to change your, your plan. But September, Saturday, September twelfth. There you go. But if the whole world falls apart, I'm still coming. I ain't dying without operating on your railroad, my friend. <laughs> Dude, and, and, and speaking of the world falling apart, they canceled Train Fest today. I oh, saw that. Goodness. What the one in November? Yeah. Wow. Guys, guys, what are we doing? Come on, come on. This is. I look. I understand. The, 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 I I totally get it. This is a bad news bug. It's killed a lot of people in my area. People that I know well, as we talked about. We got to be careful. You got you got to take you got to take care. And Adam, I mean, you, you even went through it firsthand. I mean, this this is this is the real deal. You know, thank God yeah. you got healthy healthy lungs and 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 you took it seriously and you got better. But you can't stop the world. No, right? our uh, our friend Jim Sacco had heard that. Uh, the venue for Train Fest had been turned into a uh, field hospital, and they were kind of reluctant maybe to deactivate it until they knew what was happening uh, as far as the second wave and the things second like that. Wave. Oh, fair enough. Okay, that makes sense then. Oh, yeah, the second wave. Let's all talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about it, but we've, we've been making stuff up because nobody has any idea what's going on. <laughs> Uh, well, talk about the first wave would be making half of it up too. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's gonna be careful. We gotta be now. This is the closest in the five in six years. So this is the closest this uh, podcast has ever come to being political, and we, <laughs> have, <laughs> and we have to be very very careful because we all have yeah. opinions, and, <laughs> and, this, and everybody's opinion is is you know. And I and I cer I certainly don't mind that my business hasn't been able to operate for four months and. And I haven't been able to pay my employees. I have no problem with that whatsoever. <laughs> now, Lionel, are, are, you, are you guys are you guys back up and running at this point? No. What do, what do, what is Toronto waiting for? Who knows? Wow. <laughs> Even New Jersey's reopened at this point. Yeah, and it's a it's a little hard. It's a little hard when you survive stage four cancer to be scared of anything. 
Well, fair enough. <laughs> but but, uh, but on know, the plus just, side, no, this is that's there's now that's a point. That's a very important point. Like it's yeah. it's it's easy it's easy to have opinions about things based on your own experience and. I fall into this trap often, and, I, and Lionel, I'll bet you do too sometimes, where w- when you've been through hell, right, mm-hmm. sometimes sometimes you just expect everybody else to be able to go through it too. Yeah. yeah. And everybody's definition of what's really awful is based on their own experience and their own experience only. So it's that that's that's, a, that's an important point. I appreciate you bringing that up. That's, but but, but on, on the plus side here in parts of Ontario, as of midnight Friday, you can go get tattoos again. There you go. But, but, but Lionel can't start his business. <laughs> no, that's absurd. but but he can go in and get another tattoo. But the uh, you know what this will be the I, I hope this will be the only time I ever say this on this podcast. I hope podcast goes for years and years and years. I this is the only time I'll ever say this. The one thing I was bothered me the most uh, in uh, when I had stage four cancer, and I look back on it now, is how much of a coward I was in the early in the first year. And uh, it bothers me a great deal that I didn't have the fortitude to look th- uh, look at things in a more uh, logical sense, or or to accept the fact that life is the way it is. And I and I am concerned that a lot of people years from now are going to kind of look back and go, "Man, what a what a ninny I was," you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not, uh, now you've got me. Now I'm not going to say it anymore. But no, it, that's no. the one thing that bothers me the most is I was I was such a such a coward for the whole thing and i you know i your dream is to john wayne the thing out of here and i wasn't even close to that and now i look back and i think man oh man i sure let myself down at that on that particular aspect of the whole yeah adventure. but you're being hard on yourself you, you got to remember that perception is different for every person so your perception of yourself is going to be different than others perception and thank god for that right Look, in the end, that's you want an opportunity to contribute. And I'm going to argue that your stage four cancer experience opened your mind in a way that nothing else could, because that's that's how the spirit works. That's we're all set up for what we have to deal with. And we're all given right to the limit of what we can tolerate. And the harder you fight it, the harder the spirit comes back. And boom, you got to deal with something that, that's truly draconian, like stage four cancer, which is it's no joke in, 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 in any language. So. You f- you might feel you were a coward there, Lionel, and there's nothing wrong with with looking to improve yourself at any given point. But there's no you don't get to decide how other people perceive. You. And your strength is not it's you aren't you can't be a coward in the moment. You you put you got up the next day, you put one foot in front of the next, scared as hell and and upset, and but you kept going. And so whether whether they call you a miracle or not, the bottom line is that you kept going. And in the darkness. Sometimes all you can do is take a step, and that takes courage. So I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think you're hard on yourself. I, I think you have. I think there's, there's, you, you've done a hell of a lot of good for someone that is going to say that. Oh well, I was a coward. No, <laughs> buddy, you don't get to determine whether you were a coward or not. <laughs> that's that's for the rest of the world to figure out. Yeah, for sure. Anyways, that's just was you know. It's just I have a question about Soldier Summit. Good question. Um, first off, uh, Adam, you operated trains over Soldier Summit, what, on the Utah Railroad or what? Did he go away? Adam? It's, it's true. I mean, I, I'm not sure. Uh, he's, Adam? Looks like, looks like he's still here. Adam? Adam? Okay. Oh, there he is. Oh, he's oh, gone. Oh, he's gone he's again. Not. So, yeah. So, I'll, I'll start that answer just because I, I love it so much that I've done a lot of research <laughs> on it. Um, so the Utah Railway and the Denver and Rio Grande Western we're competing for routes through central Utah between the Salt Lake Basin and the coal fields and helper down towards Colorado to the east. And a negotiated settlement, and maybe he knows who, who negotiated that, whether it was the government or somebody else. But basically, the Rio Grande and the Utah Railway each own one of the two tracks on Soldier Summit. But they're dispatched by the Rio Grande, as, or Union Pacific now, as a double track main line, even though Utah pays for the maintenance on one of the two tracks, right? And pays the commission to have that one track operate. But the but the trains will run on you know one track or the other at the dispatcher's discretion. Right. Okay. So yeah. So one of the tracks was maintained by Utah, but they were both used. Whoever was the dispatcher and controlling the railroad used the tracks as he as he saw fit. 
Correct. So there's, there's and there's lots of relationships like that around the United States through history because the railroad is so old, and there are so many of these huge proxy wars when they were setting these things up that it's a you know it's it's almost like a joint trackage rights agreement, two parallel main lines that are operated as, as double track CTC. Right. Yeah. CN, CN and CP have that kind of arrangement out uh, Western Canada and the Fraser Canyon. They're running trains one way on. CN lines and the other way on the CP lines, and even in parts of Ontario, they're doing that now. I've and I've heard that. Didn't they do that? Just uh, is it just just west of Toronto or Montreal? That there's a double track. There used to be two double track main lines side by side, and do they pony on both of them now or something like that? Uh, depending where you are, yeah, they'll be running uh, yeah, whichever line. I know out in the the Fraser Canyon, they've got them uh, set up so there, and then <laughs> yeah, through. Okay. Uh, uh, Ontario uh, for a while uh, before they took the tracks up, they were doing that up the Ottawa Valley, running CP one way and seeing the other way. So Adam, I was just asking uh, Dave about running trains over Soldier Summit on the Utah Railway, and so how often do you, th- how many times do you think you ran over the uh, over Soldier Summit? You were actually, uh, I like this is something we have not really delved into. Adam, I'm telling you, buddy, one of these days I'm going to come out there and I'm going to drop you like a a, a three foot putt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> do, you want, do you want me put Do you want me put a putting green at my house? Or yeah, what? put in a putting green, will you? and I'll drop you like yeah. a three. Foot. <laughs> yeah, put, put it in near where your uh, your waterfall there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't even get you got, the... got a water hazard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get a water hazard. Yeah. <laughs> So this this waterfall, this waterfall. Yeah. Well, yeah, hang, hang on, we'll get back to that. Uh, so. Okay. So uh, how many, how, uh, how often, how many trains, like how, what was the length of time? Like we cannot pass over the soldier summit. It's such a famous piece of railroading. We have a guy here that actually operated locomotives and trains over soldier summit. Well, how, how long were you doing that? Five years, five years. Yeah. And, wh- I, uh, and uh, can I ask you a question? Do you yeah. mind? Do you mind if I ask a question? Can ask away. Why haven't we not talked about this in depth before? We we really should before I forget it all. Yeah, we really should. My goodness. Record goodness. it for the posterity. Record it for posterity, exactly. So you for five years you were running trains over Soldier Summit. <laughs> yeah, five years. I uh, Like I said, and for Utah Railway, I prob- during that, uh, the last three anyway, I probably took more trains over Soldier Summit than anybody else, hands down. There's, I don't. I pretty much took every single one that Utah Railway had. God, that's awesome. <laughs> and and because you were running the helpers or what? I didn't get – the last couple of years, I didn't get called on the helps very often, but uh, um, only in, like, dire situations because it got to a certain point where I was the only one qualified to do that out of Provo aside from the two okay. guys that were – in helper and one of the guys that was in helper was all right when- time, time out time out you were, there? You, yeah you were cutting out so let's go back all right let's there's going to be a lot of editing okay. there's going to be a lot of editing in this because of of your internet and you know I'm what i'm sorry i, I owe you, you I owe yeah you, you do yeah and somehow yeah. Dave, somehow Dave will send me a t-shirt yeah send me a t-shirt yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna hear we're gonna hear this, this this podcast will be this time next year based on the editing yeah <laughs> <laughs> um okay so you were about to say you were the only guy really qualified to take trains over soldier summit and how did that how did that end up being like what what qualifications do you need to take a train over soldier summit or did you need just c- consistency i mean every there's most every engineer at utah Railway could but after you don't run a line for six months you have to take a requalification trip and which means that you have to go up with a road foreman or another engineer or something to get signed off on it. And it usually takes like one or two trips. Um, you know, one trip for the familiarization and another one to get signed off, especially on the mountain because it's a pretty serious uh, piece of railroad. But uh, so nobody done it. Like I was the only, aside from like the one guy that ran the, um, that he, he held the job that ran the, uh, the coal trains, which they called the uh, East pool. When he retired, the, I, they ran every train off the extra board. They just, they didn't bid rebid that job and they just ran it off the extra board. Well, I was the only one on the extra board. Wow. So, so I caught every single one of them, you know, and if they had to, uh, if they had to dog the train or, you know, come up and relieve us because we ran out of time, they'd had, you know, they ended up having to get somebody requalified just to do that. But 
it was, you know, then it did, but it took a while, you know, and while I was on the extra board was when it was the busiest time that we've had up until, I mean, the last of the busy times and none of the trains were making it. So like I said, when, before I was running the full route, I was bringing three trains a day off the hill. Where would you, pick, where were you so, picking, where were you picking them up? I would get them, uh, I would get them anywhere from, uh, just depends on how far they made it. All right, you got to start again. Stop. Stop. So, just uh, let, let me ask you this question again. Let me ask you this question again. <laughs> oh man! I think the board got him. <laughs> Why am I laughing? Oh. Why am I laughing? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out. You, you're the one who's got to edit all this. <laughs> If any, anything, you should be pounding your head on the desk. <laughs> yeah, I am. Don't did worry. We hear, oh, okay. we, oh, there he goes. <laughs> you did uh, hear the dog barking, at least. Yeah, you? yeah, we did. Yeah, maybe the dog ate him. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? The dog ate our guest. Yeah, the dog ate our guest. Okay, so okay. that's it. I've had a little nap. I'm feeling a bit better. Uh... Obviously, the last thing we hear before the subway chime is the dog ate our guest, which is pretty much what happened. Uh, I they, hope he's okay. I hope he is, too. Uh, the uh, Internet started getting so bad that Adam couldn't really converse with us uh, properly. So that's where we ended. The dog ate our guest. And uh, now you're back dealing with me and okay. David. Um, how did how many memberships did you get done while the show was playing? One every six minutes. <laughs> is that what it is? I've one about every six minutes. <laughs> it's, uh, that's what I've kind of. It, it takes about yeah. There's, uh, my guess is uh, I, I do about ten an hour. Ten an hour. Okay. So let me get out the calculator because it, it, it just I just can't go any faster than that. All right. Yeah, it's fine. I'm not complaining. Yeah, I know. It, it, a lot of hours. <laughs> That's 6,600 minutes divided by 60. It's 110 hours to do uh, 1,100. So you're doing it for about five, <clears throat> five days straight. That's a lot of work, man. Right. That is a lot of work. If you just yeah, did it, pretty much. It's, right. you, it's a labor of love. Sure. And obviously, because uh, this is such a labor-intensive job, obviously you get a free membership uh, out of from the Erie Lackawanna Society? Mm. Uh, nope. We, even, even the board members, we all pay our way. Wow. No freebies. No, 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 no free, no, freeloaders allowed. Wow. Well, you're not freeloading if you're doing membership. You're putting in hundreds of hours. Well. Well, how do you not? It's my donation. Okay. It, 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 it's, it, it's something that I can do to, 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 to help preserve history. For how much does the calendar cost? Um, uh, it, it's about a, with, with, with shipping, it runs about $15. And um, how many full people? Color. Full color. Uh, is it the is it the men of the Erie Lackawanna? Um, it you generally it it is a mixture of Erie and Delaware Lackawanna and Western and Erie Lackawanna. There's usually some. Uh, there's a little bit of black and white. There's a little bit of color. There's uh, there's some steam. There's some diesel. There's some structure you know we, we we try to get a full spectrum of pictures in every calendar that way that way that way everybody is happy isn't that what it's all about keeping everybody happy Ab absolutely there's, <laughs> there's got to be something in it for everyone otherwise somehow we failed <laughs> that's why you help me with the intros because when i do them by myself and the outros they're so bad we need to keep everybody happy uh, so, okay, so let's review. I may lose my job after this particular one. I don't think so. I think I'm the weak link here in the in the chain. 
Uh, you, you're doing a lot better than me. So let's review. Uh, at the beginning of the show, we talked about the Jenkins. Uh, we'll put up a few pictures on the website so people can right. see. But it's him sticking his left hand out. He's uh, right. Usually he's a mouth breather, and he's and he kind of has this uh, look of surprise that he still has five fingers. So that's pretty much the way I would describe that picture. Right. And so we're asking everybody to do. I refer to it as dumb looks are still free. Dumb looks are still free. Yeah. And we're asking everybody to do their version of the Jenkins. Send them in. We're going to have a team of judges go over right. them. And then we're going to, the last five, uh, we'll, we'll leave for the contest, which is closes March 18th, which is when COVID started for us. And uh, then whoever wins, then they'll receive a little pile of swag and something else, uh, another T-shirt or something. We'll send them something cool. So that's uh, that's where we're at right now. I can't wait to see the entries. Yeah, me too. I got it. I think I should set up a web page so they can all be there. And I think what we'll do is every we'll have a team of guys. Team, we'll have some of the crack staff from uh, Busted Knuckle AML to be, uh, you know, narrow it down to you know ten or twenty or something like that. And then we'll then we'll let uh, uh, Tom's Tom and his mascot. We'll let them choose them. And you know, if their house is ablaze while it's happening, okay. well, so be it. <laughs> Um, which we don't, why would I say that? I was thinking of wildfires. I'm half dreaming right now. This is a very interesting, I should be, I hope I'm on the happy, I hope I'm on the happy grass. This is what, this was what the podcast would sound like if I was uh, smoking the happy grass. Um, all right. So (laughs) (laughs) you want to do the, uh, you feel like doing the email? No, um, not really. Well, I can attempt it. You want me to do it? Well, I'll attempt. Right. I'll, I'll attempt. All right. For those who would like, are you are you going to interrupt me, or are you going to let me do it? No. <laughs> well, I barely said anything. Okay, I so... said all right. <laughs> what? Like, don't forget. Okay. Don't forget. There's no A. <laughs> like. Okay, go. Right. Uh, I, I've listened to the show before. <laughs> All right. For those who would like to contact via <laughs> via electronic medium called email, the email address is Modeler's Life. That's Modeler with one L at gmail dot com. That's uh, one he- one L like Lehigh, not two L's like Valley. Uh, I was thinking one L like Camel, and not two L's like Llama. <laughs> That's a good one too. Camo and llama. <laughs> and we have a website, a modelerslife.com. If you go there, uh you'll find out everything you need to know about the and there's hopefully by now a Jenkins page, but you'll find out everything you need to know about the podcast and if you don't want to type out the address, if you just uh click on the picture of the moderately agitated mailboy in a particularly agitated state, It'll automatically set up an email, and all you got to do is fill in the blanks. We got a couple of really interesting lately, so I think we better do another email show uh, based on not not the uh, volume, okay. but more the quality. And the other thing, okay. the other thing we that's should tell you, quality is important. Yeah, uh, the other thing we should well, we got a mem- we got an email from somebody who's a regular listener in Chile. So it's our first email from South cool. America. Yeah, I know. The whole podcast is cool. People all over the world listen to this thing. Um, where was I? Oh yeah. So, uh, go to the website, and if you're there, uh, if you want some AML merchandise, you can go to Midwest Model Railroad. Uh, they have a great online store. They're in Independence, Missouri. They have a great actual store. I highly recommend you go there if you're uh, in the in the area. And say hi to Gary and Steve, and uh, that they you can buy all your AML merchandise. You can buy hats, mugs, shirts, hoodies, no matter whatever you need is right there in the AML shop. You just it's right in the navigation bar. You slide along AML, boom, you're there. So that's where it is, Midwest Model Railroad, and the URL is MidwestModelRR.com. 
beautiful. Great guys. Great story. And I, I I need to go. I need I need it. I need I need a coffee mug. There you go. Yeah, go buy a coffee mug. Um. So yeah. And then uh, what else was I going to say about the website? Anyways, it's right there. It's really fun. All kinds of stuff. And what else? I think that's it, isn't it? I think we've covered it all. So this is a free show. Uh, we put this one up. This was going to be a Patreon show. But because the internet crapped out for Adam, we turned it into a free show. And then the free show is actually going to be tomorrow's show, which is this. these two days are all Pinellas all the time. So this is great. So just enjoy this okay. show. Enjoy the exit. Enjoy everything. And then we'll explain everything to you tomorrow when we start the next show. So are you ready, David? I am ready. So remember... Remember, a Modeler's Life podcast is considered marginally adequate by six out of ten excavator operators. It's time for the New Jersey Transit Elevator Escalator Report. Take it away, Dave. Dave? Dave? Good morning, everybody. Uh, Westfield, westbound. Uh, just out of service in the last hour or so. The vendor's en route. Uh, take a look at that one. Ab Seekins back in service this morning. Uh, Trenton Transit Center, number four, uh, escalator. This one, I... I we're not really sure exactly what happened. Nice vision shows a bunch of people on it. It just sort of stops uh, the brake engage. So I think we'll just be a quick reset, but we'll check it this morning. Union Center Island is still out for its midlife overhaul. Uh, Montclair State University number two is out. That one's the parking deck responsibility. So they'll put it back in service this afternoon, hopefully. And North Penn Station elevator number 37 is still out for its door replacement. Um, we're not real thrilled with the vendor performance on that guy, but. It'll, it'll come around here like everything else. So I'll keep you posted. It's another Lincoln Homer. I like that. That's because he uh, ripped out the cord, right? Is that where you're going with that one? Dug up his lawn. Yeah, dug up his lawn and ripped uh, up his, his... I thought it was most appropriate. Yeah, because he dug up his uh, TV and cable. Cable. 